there's a, a historical context for elected judges in the states in America that goes back to Jacksonian democracy. And the Jacksonian approach was a populist approach so that many of the states that uh, their constitutions were developed in the 1820s, 1830s, and going into the 1880s, uh, they opted for an elected judiciary. Uh, and then uh, during the progressive period, the reform movement was to institute a, a selection process which would take some of that uh, and put it into a, a more of a, an executive-oriented approach where the judges would be selected in the first instance by governors with the advice of people who were expert, who were uh, attorneys, other judges, and members of the public. The first one was the Missouri Plan. Uh, and the Missouri Plan was a reaction uh, to this uh, method of picking judges, which was an unrestrained populism. Uh, and the theory was that the, uh, the branches which were supposed to be popularly elected were the executive and the legislative branch, and the judiciary, as it is in the federal system, was intended to be a check on the populist impulse. Uh, this uh, Missouri plan was uh, so successful that it was adopted in a number of states, uh, but it has come under attack more recently. And what have been the sources of the attack? Uh, the sources have been uh, in part the result of uh, a Supreme Court decision, Republican Party of Minnesota versus White. Uh, and Republican Party of Minnesota versus White had to do with canons of judicial ethics, uh, which provided cover for people who were running for judicial office, uh, who were being presented with questionnaires which really were seeking to determine how they would rule in particular cases. And of course, uh, under judicial ethics, you're not supposed to announce how you are going to rule in a future judicial case. Uh, and so through the canons of judicial ethics, candidates were simply precluded from being able to, to discuss or being forced to discuss how they would rule in particular cases. The White decision said that under the First Amendment, uh, candidates uh, were uh, forced to really respond to those polls, and so they were in, in effect forced to announce how they would rule in particular cases. Uh, that led uh, to an enormous drive uh, to require candidates to disclose information which is not appropriate in judicial elections. The second piece of it was campaign finance reform. And it, reform in this case was a misnomer because what it meant was that large amounts of money started to pour into judicial elections. And so between the candidates being forced to talk more about their positions and lots of money coming into these campaigns, you started to have judicial campaigns which stopped looking like discussions of the issues and really relatively quiet affairs where decisions were made based upon the qualifications of the candidates and started to look like some of the worst of the kind of excessive campaigns that we've seen both in the legislative and in the executive context. In fact, we started to see the same campaign consultants who worked on those types of campaigns being brought into judicial campaigns. And we have seen some very ugly and unpleasant and untruthful campaigns. Of course, for sitting judges, they're faced with fighting these campaigns with one hand tied behind their back because they can't discuss their rulings in particular cases. Uh, they can't discuss why they came to the conclusions that they, they came to. Uh, and so it really became an unfair targeting of sitting justices uh, and a, and a very unpleasant uh, way of conducting judicial campaigns. We've seen these around the country. In states where there are now contested elections, Justice O'Connor believes that adoption of some form of merit selection would improve the process and would counter the notion that judges are no more than politicians in robes. After all, if you are a, appearing in a courtroom and you know that the attorneys who are appearing in front of the judge have both contributed to that judge's re-election campaign or that judge's election campaign, that's a source of serious concern as to whether the judge can be fair and impartial. And of course, we hope that notwithstanding these campaign contributions, judges will be fair and impartial. But the perception alone that they may not be is sufficient to create real doubt in the public mind as to the fairness of the system.